Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the fourth dimension. And when I say fourth dimension, I'm not talking about time. Uh, I'm talking about a hypothetical, theoretical fourth dimension of space that I believe actually exists, and I believe that it might relate to what we think of as the spirit world or uh, you know, what, what the Bible uh, uh, describes as spiritual reality. One verse that I like is 1 Corinthians 13, 12, which says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now I think in the original context of this, it's talking about prophecy, you know, that we have these prophecies throughout Bible. We throughout the Bible, we don't know exactly how they're all going to piece together, but we will someday. And then even more importantly, Jesus, uh, there's going to come a day where we're going to know him the way he knows us. Um, but also, I think that this could tie in to just reality itself, creation itself. Because right now we see in part, we see three dimensions of space and one of time. Uh, but we all pretty much figure there's more than that. You know, whatever the spirit world is, uh, could we count that as uh, a higher dimension? We're going to be talking about that um, today. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, too, because it's easy for us to visualize objects within our three dimensions of space. We can even visualize one and two dimensional space. But when it comes to a fourth dimension of space, visualization or imagination about that is pretty much impossible. So the question then could come up, well, why even bother with it? Uh, with, with something that we can't imagine? Well, I think that there's good answers to this question. So first of all, it's important because it's a part of God's creation. Uh, in modern physics, the idea of a fourth spatial dimension is technically theoretical, but uh, like I mentioned, I, I equate the fourth spatial dimension with the spirit world, uh, so I'm treating it as a biblical fact. And learning things and entertaining possibilities can help us understand the complexities of God's design. This understanding can lead to a uh, more full grasp of some of the more supernatural things written about in the Bible. Uh, second, it can be used as an apologetic and witnessing tool. If you're attempting to defend your faith or share the gospel with somebody who already has an understanding of some of the theories surrounding modern physics, then it's a great advantage to be able to speak to them in uh, terms that they'll understand. And that's especially true in providing answers from a biblical worldview to questions that come from a scientific worldview. So common examples of those who employ this tactic are Christians who say they study earth sciences to defend the position of a possible young earth creation, or Christians who study biology to refute the theory of evolution. So in the same way as these, the, modern, uh, the study of modern physics can aid in defending a belief in spiritual existence. And then third, because it's just fascinating, the idea of a reality beyond what we can physically experience is a belief that falls right in line with biblical Christianity. So why wouldn't we want to learn more about it if we had the opportunity? And of course, there's many other reasons for this type of study, but that's just a, that's just three in my personal list. And even though we may not be able to visualize what a fourth spatial dimension would look like, there are tricks that we can use to help understand it. So we're going to be looking at a few of these tricks uh, throughout this part of the video. And this by no means is a completely exhaustive study of all the methods used to explain the fourth spatial dimension. Uh, the examples included here are just a few that are easier to grasp than the many that are available. Uh, so probably the best method I, I've come across in understanding higher spatial dimensions is used in uh, fictional literatures. And one popular example of this among physicists, and one that I'll be referring to, uh, from time to time, and uh, have been for years, is a novella entitled Flatland. Uh, it's called Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions by E.A. Abbott from 1884. It's totally free to read. You can go online and find it. Um, but the basic idea is to use the written word to help the reader imagine what our three-dimensional world would look like from the perspective of a two-dimensional being. And when considering the two-dimensional perspective, that can help us understand what the fourth spatial dimension would look like compared to our three-dimensional perspective. So in Flatland, the main character is named A Square, and he tells us of his experience as a two-dimensional being who later encounters the third spatial dimension. So he begins his story by first explaining what his reality um, would, would look like from our three-dimensional perspective. So here's a quote. 
Nothing was visible nor could be visible to us except straight lines, and the necessity of this I will speedily demonstrate. Place a penny on the middle of one of your tables in space, and leaning over it, look down upon it. It will appear as a circle. But now, drawing back to the edge of the table, gradually lower your eye, thus bringing yourself more and more into the condition of the inhabitants of Flatland, and you will find the penny becoming more and more oval to your view, and at last, when you place your eye exactly on the edge of the table so that you are, as it were, actually a flatland citizen, the penny will then have ceased to appear oval at all and will have become, so far as you can see, a straight line, end quote. Um, so since flatland would only consist of the X and Y axes, there would be no up or down. There would only be side to side and front to back. And because of this, the perspective of flatlanders would be considerably different from our own. Any shape they would be looking at would appear to them as a line. So imagine if you were able to breach Flatland as a three-dimensional being. Let's say you were able to just stick your finger through their two-dimensional space. Let's say their two-dimensional space is here. You, just, you were able to stick your finger through it. Well, what would that look like to Flatlanders? You know, they would see a very small point in space and, and, and followed by a very small line segment appear out of nowhere uh, as your finger passes through now, in two-dimensional reality, you know, th this would be a circle, but since Flatlanders lack the ability to see the entire shape, they can't see it from above, it would look to them as a line right in front of them. So similarly, in our three spatial dimensions of reality, we cannot see around to the backside of solid and opaque objects that are right in front of us. So technically, everything we see is in two-dimensional perspective. Um, or we have three-dimensional perspective, but it's in it's it's like a two-dimensional flat image. Like I can't I can't look outside my back window and see the neighbor's fence, and I, I can't see around that fence. I would have to physically move around the fence to see that. Well, it's the same with you putting your finger in Flatland. If a Flatlander was looking at it this way, they wouldn't be able to see the backside, so they can't see the full circle of your finger. They would just see what's right in front of them. This line here. Um. So as your finger passes through this two-dimensional plane, they would see that line segment grow in size because your finger is wider here than it is here. And uh, when you take your finger out again, they would see the line segment shrink in size and then disappear, seeming to vanish in thin air. Um, you could also stick your whole hand uh, through two-dimensional space. Now, if you did that, at first they would see like a small line segment appear uh, as the tip of your middle finger uh, breaches through two-dimensional space. Next, your index and ring finger would break through, right? And, and uh, the Flatlanders would see two more segments appear on either side as the first one grows in size. Then as your pinky and your thumb break through, they would see two more segments appear. Uh, and what they would see next would be truly surprising. As the rest of your hand goes through, so... About here, they would see all five of these segments, which is your fingers. But if you push your hand even further through, all those segments would converge into uh, one large segment. Then as your wrist went through, they would see that larger segment shrink in size. And then when you pull your hand out, they would see the entire spectacle, spectacle again, only this time in reverse, until all the segments disappear completely. Now imagine... If you were able to take a, it, well, and think about it this way. If you put your fingers in like this and moved them around, they would see five different segments moving around independently. They wouldn't know that all five of these segments uh, are attached to one thing. They would see them as separate. Um, now imagine if you were able to take a Flatlander out of his two-dimensional environment and thrust him into our three spatial uh, dimensions. What would he see? Well, the Flatlander would still have eyes that could only perceive two dimensions. Even if you tried to position him in a way that was facing directly at you, all the Flatlander could, could, would, could see would be a line made of basically differently colored segments, depending which line on your face he's looking at, how, how high you're, you're putting him. So his view of your hair, face, shirt, pants, shoes, uh, that would be nothing more than uh, a multicolored line. If you are moving, the Flatlander would only see a single line of changing color. So we can use the example of Flatland to help understand what a four-dimensional interaction would be like in our three-dimensional world. So 
If a four-dimensional sphere, which is called a hypersphere, were to move through our three spatial dimensions, we would only be able to perceive it through our three-dimensional eyes. We wouldn't see the whole four-dimensional object. We would see a very tiny sphere, so not, not a line segment or a circle. You know, it, it, This would be a tiny sphere um, suddenly appear as it breaches our dimension. We would see the sphere grow in size as it moves through our dimension, uh, shrink in size as it moves out, then disappear completely. So using the same example, if we were able to travel to the fourth spatial dimension from our perspective, it would look like three-dimensional objects were changing color, growing, shrinking, appearing, and disappearing as they moved through four-dimensional space. Uh, these, of course, would not actually be three-dimensional objects. They would possess a fourth dimension, but since our eyes can only perceive three dimensions, to us, they would look like ever-changing three-dimensional objects. Uh, it probably looked like you're on some kind of drug trip or something. But uh, this also helps explain why we can't actually see the fourth spatial dimension. So just as flatlanders would have no concept or method of truly perceiving the z-axis that defines uh, our third dimension of space up and down, um, we have no way of perceiving the fourth spatial dimension in that same way. So in fact, uh, German physicist Hermann von Helmholtz uh, compared our in inability to see the fourth spatial di dimension to the inability of a blind person to understand color. There's no way to describe a color to somebody who has never seen it. Another interesting thing to consider is the fact that though Flatlanders wouldn't be able to perceive the third dimension, it's still all around them. In fact, it's even touching them. Um, that is how the fourth spatial dimension is in relation to us. Though we, we can't even begin to picture what the fourth spatial dimension would look like, it is all around us. It's, it's touching us. Um, the, it, it's even inside us. The way that, like a flatlander, the third spatial dimension would be, you know, if you have a flatlander and you're looking down at the flatlander, you can see inside of the flatlander. Well, that's because we have three-dimensional perspectives. So the third spatial dimension is even inside of the flatlander. Well, it's the same with the fourth dimension with us. Um, it's actually touching us. And uh, so the reality of spiritual existence is here. It's literally right in front of our faces. We just can't see it. Now, another interesting idea from Flatland is that of imprisonment. And this, this, uh, this connects with the Bible as well. So in Flatland, a circle can simply be drawn around a Flatlander to imprison him in jail. Uh, so for the Flatlander, escape would not be possible. But for if a three-dimensional person were to come along and just pick the Flatlander out of that circle and put him back in Flatland outside of the circle, um, well, then the Flatlander would be free. It'd be that easy. So to other Flatlanders it would look like the Flatlander disappeared while in jail, then reappeared outside of it. Now, this actually might help us wrap our heads around Peter's miraculous jailbreak in the book of Acts. Uh, as it is written, uh, and this is starting in Acts 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold... The angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were in when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So that's Acts uh, 12, 1 through 10. 
So Peter's escape can be likened to the idea of a three-dimensional being helping a flatlander escape circle jail. In the account of Acts, we have the angel of the Lord, which is clearly a higher dimensional being, um, and the angel helps Peter escape imprisonment by causing the chains to fall from his hands. The, uh, the angel then leads Peter out of the prison. This was such a fantastic event for Peter that as he was following the angel, he didn't even know if he was experiencing this for real or if it was a vision. The angel and Peter then reach the iron gate that led to the city. The iron gate opens seemingly by itself, which allows Peter to leave. So using examples of how these things would work in Flatland helps us understand how they could be possible in our own reality. We just have to think of a similar experience that could happen in a two-dimensional plane and consider how it would look if the third spatial dimension became involved. Uh, then we just compare that experience to the idea of a fourth spatial dimension becoming involved in our three-dimensional reality. So an event such as a jailbreak would be just as miraculous to a Flatlander as it is to us when a being of higher dimensions gets involved. Now, that being said, this in no way uh, can be used to discredit or naturalize miraculous phenomena. When a miracle happens, whether from the fourth spatial dimension, higher dimensions, or completely outside of dimensional reality, it's ultimately, it ultimately originates from God, and, it is, uh, and it's still an incredibly holy and blessed experience. So if anything, gaining understanding of the fourth spatial dimension should help us appreciate God, creation, and the miraculous even more. Now, Flatland is, is not the only work of fiction that tackles this mind-bending subject of the fourth spatial dimension. I do believe that Flatland contains the most reliable or relatable uh, examples that we can use in our own understanding. So I'll probably be referring to that one specifically um, throughout this video. And you and I usually do when I when I try to explain these things. However, there are other uh, great works of fiction that can be mentioned. Um, so H.G. Wells, the author of The Time Machine and a slew of others, wrote of the fourth uh, spatial dimension. So in his short story, um, Oh, and, and I should mention, too, in The Time Machine, H.G. Wells did write about time as the fourth dimension in a, in a temporal sense, you know, as time. Um, but in the story we're going to look at right now, um, the fourth dimension that he tackled was spatial. So in his short story uh, entitled The Plattner Story, H.G. Wells wrote of a science teacher by the name of Gottfried Plattner. And in the story, Plattner conducts a chemical experiment that ends up going wrong. The result is Plattner being sent into um, a higher reality and into the, into the fourth dimension, basically. And when he returns to the real world, Plattner realizes his body is not quite the same as it was before he left. His heart is now on the right side, and he is now left-handed. When he's examined, uh, the doctors discover that Plattner's entire body has been reversed. And this is deduced as proof that he moved into the fourth spatial dimension uh, was flipped around basically and returned. Now, of course, this type of reversal of body organs is not possible in our normal three dimensions of space. So to understand how this could be possible with the aid of a fourth spa spatial dimension, all we got to do is think back to Flatland. If we wanted to reverse a Flatlander, all we would need to do is pull him up out of two dimensions, flip him around in our three dimensions of space and just put him back. Uh, now, we might be inclined to think that all this would do, do to a Flatlander is cause him to be facing the opposite way, but remember, for a Flatlander, there is no up or down. So because of this, they don't have a top or a bottom. So therefore, if one is actually flipped like that in our third spatial dimension, when he returns to his original plane of existence, his entire body would be literally reversed. Seems like a simple thing to us, but it would be a very complicated thing to them. So we can use this story to understand what H.G. Wells was getting at or we can use this example to understand what H.G. Wells was getting at in the Plantner story. For a, person, for, for a person's internal organs to all be reversed, he would have to be flipped around in the fourth spatial dimension before returning. Now, there's no way to know exactly what that would look like in four dimensions of space. We, can't, we don't have the ability to visualize that, but we can recognize the result of such an action. So that is why it was recognized as proof that Plantner travel to the fourth spatial dimension and returned. It would be the only way that that type of body reversal could be possible. Um, so uh, attempting to explain what happened to Plantner in regards to the reversal he endured, 
The narrator of the story says, quote, There is no way of taking a man and moving him about in space, as ordinary people understand space, that will result in our changing his sides. Whatever you do, his right is still his right, his left his left. You can do that with a perfectly thin and flat thing, of course. If you were to cut a figure out of paper, any figure with a right and left side, you could change its side simply by lifting it up and turning it over. But with a solid, it is different. Mathematical theorists tell us the only way in which the right and left sides of a solid body can be changed is by taking that body clean out of space as we know it, taking it out of, igno taking it out of ordinary existence, that is, and turning it somewhere outside of space. This is a little abstruse, no doubt, but anyone with any knowledge of mathematical theory will assure the reader of its truth. Truth. To put the thing in technical language, the curious inversion of Plattner's right and left sides is proof that he has moved out of our space into what is called the fourth dimension and that he has returned again to our world, end quote. Now, as an interesting uh, side note in the story, Plantner encounters beings in the fourth spatial dimension, and these beings are known as watchers of the living, or just watchers for short. Uh, they are also reminiscent of human beings in three-dimensional space, even to the point of seeming to project certain personality traits and qualities of the specific human they are connected with by way of watching. Now, for those who are familiar with Genesis 6, the book of Enoch, and biblical descriptions of familiar spirits, things like that, these details of the Watchers and the Plattner sport, uh, story will prove to be pretty interesting. Now, H.G. Wells wrote another story called The Wonderful Visit, in which a man accidentally shoots an angel out of the sky, thinking that it's a bird. When the man confronts the angel, he discovers that the angel is just as surprised by the man's existence as the man is about the angel's. So part of their conversation goes like this. Uh, quote, And in some incomprehensible manner I have fallen into this world of yours out of my own, said the angel, into the world of my dreams, grown real. It is confusing, said the vicar. It almost makes one think there may be a hem. Four dimensions, after all, in which case, of course, he went on hurriedly, for he loved geometrical speculations and took a certain pride in his knowledge of them. There may be any number of three-dimensional universes packed side by side and all dimly dreaming of one another. There may be world upon world, universe upon universe. It's perfectly possible. There's nothing so incredible as the absolute possible as the absolutely possible. But I wonder how you came to fall out of your world into mine. End quote. So in, in this story, the angel inhabits the world of the fourth spatial dimension. Beings in the angel's world are no more aware of three-dimensional humans as humans are of angels. The angel and the man deduce that they live in separate worlds that overlap. Uh, of course, we can compare some things in this story to what the Bible says about angels, but not everything. Angels do seem to e exist in a plane of existence that overlaps our own, at least to a point, but the idea that angels aren't aware of our existence can't really be backed up by the Bible. So we, you know, we got to keep in mind with these types of stories that it's only fiction. Uh, we, we might be able to glean some examples to support biblical ideas from things such as this, but we should not, not try to build entire doctrines out of them. So that being said, it makes for an entertaining story. Now, the, wor the work of H.G. Uh, Wells opened up literature to a new type of fiction. So in 1895, George MacDonald mixed ideas about parallel dimensions and mysticism with Christian symbolism in his book, Lilith. In Lilith, George MacDonald tells the story of Mr. Vane, uh, a man who comes into contact with an extra-dimensional being named Mr. Raven. Mr. Vane travels to the other dimension by way of a mirror with Mr. Raven. It's later discovered that Mr. Raven is, in fact, the biblical Adam. Mr. Vane also encounters giants in this realm, as well as Lilith, the supposed first wife of Adam. So again, we've got to keep in mind that uh, while some of these stories are entertaining, it doesn't mean we gain doctrine from them. Now, it's weird that, you know, Watchers, the Nephilim, the giants, th these keep coming up in these stories. And this was well before anybody would have connected them with anything multidimensional. Um because there is, you know, there's spiritual and there's natural. And back then they, they didn't really think of them like that. So again, but we don't, we don't gain doctrine from these. So the idea of Lilith as the first wife of Adam before Eve is not a biblical teaching. 
Uh, and in, in fact, George MacDonald himself was a Christian universalist, meaning he believed everyone would eventually be saved and there's no eternal damnation. Though MacDonald believed this, he did write of a dim- divine judgment and earned salvation in Lilith, uh, though he wrote of some principles that are biblical He also wrote of many that are not. Therefore, we can't really use this work as an accurate portrayal of the author's beliefs. Um, And again, nor should we gain doctrine from it. But but again, it it, it is interesting that these people were inspired to write these stories about the fourth dimension. And somehow they keep including angels, Nephilim watchers and that that makes me wonder you know were they inspired for a reason do do the watchers or the nephilim the giants in genesis 6 in the book of enoch do these have something to do with the fourth spatial dimension um now i I personally do believe that the fourth spatial dimension is real and a big part of that i think it can be shown simply in science you know they say that um an object of a lot of mass or really any mass it bends space and a lot of times you see that example of like a bowling ball on a bed sheet. And the bed sheet, you can see that it's, it's bending, you know. The weight of the bowling ball brings down the bed sheet. Well, in, in that, the bed sheet's a two-dimensional surface. If that's happening in space, it wouldn't just be down. It would actually be bending space in all directions. And that's hard to visualize, but it would be bending space in all directions. And that's what they do. The Earth does that. The sun does that. Even you and me do that. Well, just like the bed sheet, the bed sheet needs an extra dimension. It needs a third dimension to bend into. So while the top of the bed sheet's a two-dimensional surface, if there were no third dimension, th- that bed sheet would never bend because there would be nothing for it to bend into. For it to bend down, it needs up and down. So I would assume that, the, this again, this is how you can use the idea of a, of a two-dimensional reality you know, hypothetically, but you can use that to help explain some of these things. If space in the same way is bending around Earth and the sun and black holes and all this stuff, well, it needs space to bend into. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't bend at all. So just even scientifically, to me, there must be, there, there has to be a fourth dimension of space. Um, and... But, but again, it's really interesting that this keeps being tied into the Watchers of Nephilim and stuff. And if you think about it, the, 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 you know, the, what Enoch says about the Watchers and, and the Nephilim, or even if you don't like the Book of Enoch, you can just stick with Genesis. It's the same thing. But um, Angel, th- this, is, this is a time where for at least fourth dimensional beings, if not more, they, in a sense, fell down to Earth uh, and somehow inhabited three-dimensional bodies in some way that was able to procreate. And they procreated with uh, human women to make these enormous um, Nephilim giant hybrid offspring things. So it was a time where beings of a higher dimension interacted with our three-dimensional world. And a lot of people think that that's going to happen again, prophetically, that there's a time. And and actually, it might be happening now. Um, When you think about the descriptions of Flatland and, and what what it would look like if you were to put an object in flatland and move it around and take it out. There's a lot of people with a lot of uh, UFO reports that describe the same thing just in three dimensions. Starts out as a tiny little pinpoint of light or a sphere, and then it grows, splits into two, goes back together, disappears. That's exactly what we would expect if something from a fourth spatial dimension or higher is interacting with our world. And then you throw on top of that... um, you know, this this whole idea of an alien hybridization program, well, that's basically the same thing as Genesis 6. That's beings of somewhere else, of a higher dimension. I don't believe that these aliens are aliens from other planets. So beings of a higher dimension are interacting and procreating with, uh, with, with hu- human beings of three dimensions. It's the same exact thing that we read about in Genesis 6 in the Book of Enoch. So it's interesting that even though many of these authors weren't Christians that we're talking about, that still many of them kind of picked up on these themes. Like they were inspired somehow by it. Uh, who, who was inspiring it? You know, who, who knows? For what purpose? Maybe to just get into the public consciousness, these, these ideas. Um, and that might lead to, you know, what, what we see a lot in sci-fi today. So a lot of this stuff um, is inspired by most likely the very same beings that are perpetrating 
uh, these invasions, I guess. So, you know, what else do you call them? Um, so it's just interesting to me that that, that that keeps coming up. There seems to be a connection with the Nephilim, the Watchers, and the fourth dimension. Uh, and, and it'll be really interesting, too, that, strangely enough, the idea of the fourth dimension was used a lot in the 18 and 1900s in witchcraft. Um, that's another thing that we might have time to get to today. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Let's just continue, and then we'll see if we have time to get to that. So uh, another work of fiction that we can look at is uh, The Inheritors, an extravagant story, and that was written in 1901 by Joseph Conrad and Ford M. Uh, Hufer, or a.k.a. Ford Maddox Ford. The Inheritors... <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the Inheritors is a story about fourth dimensional beings that carry out a plan to take over the earth. See, here we go again. And by the way, when I researched for this, I did not go out of my way to try to find old stories that have to do with the fourth dimension and have to do with angels or Nephilim. I just, I just tried to find fictional stories of the fourth dimension from this time period. And this showed up all over them, just by chance. I don't think I found one that didn't have some element of that in it. So, again, very, very strange. Uh, lots of Watcher and Nephilim stuff in here. But, uh, so this is, this is a story about fourth dimensional beings that carry out a plan to take over the Earth. The main character of the story, Arthur, is a journalist with high ideals in the beginning, and after meeting a mysterious woman who is uh, a dimensionist, that's a term used in the story to, to describe fourth dimensional beings, um, Arthur compromises his ideals in order to attract the woman and become something more in life. Now, what makes the inheritors uh, really interesting is that, again, there's a lot of themes throughout that go hand in hand with the fringe Christian eschatology defined by, again, certain understandings of Genesis 6, the return of the Nephilim, the alien gospel, and others. It's all over uh, throughout these works of fiction. Now, you probably realize that the stories referenced here are from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. There are many exam examples from that time period as well, uh, as well as our own, that I could uh, source that display the same themes. But there's a couple of reasons I picked specific stories from that time period. Uh, first, I wanted to show that uh, even more than 100 years ago, the fourth spatial dimension was being discussed in literature. It wasn't only a scientific theory. Uh, there, were, there were lay people reading about the possibilities of the fourth spatial dimension. And second, I believe that these stories adequately portray the diversity of topics that were written about during that time period concerning the fourth spatial dimension. Uh, there's a lot of other, other stories containing the same themes, and of course they continue on into today. But... But, you know, what I wanted to show, though, is this, this idea, you know, a, a lot of us Christians will complain about, like, ancient aliens and stuff, and, and how they're, they're twisting the Bible. And so, well, this, this isn't anything new. Um, th this, is, this has been going on, uh, you know, in various forms of entertainment, from books to movies, television shows. The, the idea of extra-dimensional uh, beings, some, and sometimes that's mistakenly labeled as extraterrestrial beings, there's a difference, um, but coming in contact with humanity, it's everywhere and it's increasing. Um, and th this has been going on for more than 100 years, especially in regards to higher dimensions. And because, of course, I personally share many beliefs that surround that fringe Christian eschatology, uh, I, I believe that it's possible that humanity is and has been, uh, is being prepared for something big and something that will involve higher dimensions. My personal theory about this is, you know, we've we've heard a lot about um, these alien abduction phenomena scenarios. You know, where people get abducted, the alien says that they're from another planet, and, and it's funny because they used to say that they were from uh, Venus or Mars, but now that we know that that's not possible, now they're from Zeta Reticuli or even further. Um, but even even more, even more lately, it seems like these beings are backing off the extraterrestrial thing a little bit. I mean, they're still leaning into it, but e even more, we're seeing more of these things that are claiming that they are either extra-dimensional, so from a higher dimension, or that they're us in the future. Um, which, of course, I don't believe either of those are... Uh, uh, well, okay, I, I don't believe the future thing at all, but... Uh, 
the idea that they might be from a higher dimension, that makes sense to me. And the idea that they have access somehow to three-dimensional bodies in some way that we can interact with, that makes sense to me because that's exactly what we read about in, uh, in, in Genesis and the Book of Enoch and, and things like that. So that makes us wonder, are, are we being set up? Are we being prepared for a return of these beings? Because I would, I would bet, especially lately, since about 2017, when we started getting soft disclosure, I would be willing to bet that if these beings showed themselves now, uh, and I, I actually don't think that they fully, fully can. I might be wrong on that, but um, I believe that there's a, a restrainer that the Bible talks about. And once the restrainer is removed, then these things can happen uh, more. But but let, let's say let's say I'm wrong on that. Let's say uh, uh, you know a bunch of craft, a, a bunch of craft appear in the sky, but they have extra dimensional capabilities. So we're seeing them disappear and reappear. Well, if we establish communication with those things, and if they say that they're from a higher dimension and they have things to teach us, the entire world would worship them. I mean, who who would be skeptical of that? I mean, you and I would be, <laughs> of course. But the world, by and large, they're searching for something like that. We're built as human beings to crave a savior. Now, that savior is supposed to be Jesus. You know, that's who's calling out to us. That's our shepherd. Um, but just like sheep crave a shepherd, we 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 crave a savior. They're more than happy to step in for for that. Um, they're already doing it. In fact, just through channeling and seances and. Uh, they're they're already getting people to fall away without even having to physically show up. So of course we would we would see that. Um, and, and so I, I think that it's it's a good I think it's a good guess to say that you know the great delusion, the strong delusion, the end times delusion might have something to do with these beings and what their role really is. Um, so. You know, we'll have to see, but I think that's why teachings like this and videos like this are important to show like, hey, just because something is of a different nature than ours doesn't mean that you just trust it. You know, it doesn't mean that you, you should you should be you should be as skeptical of them making any claims as you would be a human being making any claims, even if they can do seemingly miraculous things. That doesn't mean anything. Um I can do miraculous things that would be, you know, the things that would seem miraculous to my cat. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean that, that every human being can be trusted because of that. Um, anyway, so I, I mentioned before that, uh, that, yeah, okay, I think we're going to get to that next. Uh, there is a connection with the fourth dimension and, and uh, occultic beliefs, and which, of course, you know, you would expect that if uh, if these beings are using the idea of the fourth dimension to inspire uh, people to, you know, down the wrong ways of thinking, um, that, towards deceptive pathways, you know, uh, that, that would lead them astray and lead them away from Christ. Because w one of the biggest lies is that, yeah, the fourth dimension is real, but you can manipulate it. You can enter it and exit it at will. You can have access to it. No, you can't. Just like a fourth, uh, a, 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 a flatlander doesn't have access to the third dimension by nature, we, by nature, do not have access to the fourth dimension. Our time for that will come when we pass from this life, but in the meantime, no, we're not supposed to be messing with that, and there's good reason. There's very dangerous things there. 